All right, so it's one o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Shanice Fedor. I'm a program manager with the Laboratory Leadership Service Program, or LLS for short. In today's webinar, I'll share information about CDC's LLS Fellowship Program, discuss the application process, give a few tips on how to submit a competitive application, and then we'll have time for question and answer with myself, the lead of the LLS program, Tara Hennen. And we also have two current LLS fellows on the call with us today who will also be available to share a bit of their experience and answer any questions that you have. I'll also take a moment to highlight some of our current and past fellows because they're just beyond awesome. So today we have, well, right here in this photo, we have class of 2018, Brandy Freeman, um, who went on a response deployment to the, to the United States Virgin Islands Public Health Lab. The mission of LLS is to develop future public health laboratory leaders. And to do this, LLS fellows hone their leadership skills and create a culture of excellence in laboratory science by emphasizing high standards in areas such as laboratory quality and safety. LLS is a two-year program for PhD scientists in a laboratory-related field. Here we have Dave Lowe, who's the Class of 2017 fellow who worked with a novel rabies model as a part of his LLS applied research. The training and experience LLS provides are based on competencies deemed critical for success as a leader in the public health laboratory workforce. These competencies were developed in collaboration with the Association for Public Health Laboratories. They cover applied research, lab safety and quality, bioinformatics, lab management, and communications. Leadership is a key area of development as well. And the curriculum is designed to weave leadership throughout all of these competencies. During LLS, fellows are responsible for completing 10 core activities of learning, or CALS for short, to build proficiency and skills within these competency domains. Shown here, we have Class of 2020 fellow Christine Lee, who had the chance to partner with the Wisconsin Public Health Lab on a COVID testing strategy investigation among college students. She's processing samples at a Wisconsin satellite lab on a college campus as a part of that study. The fundamental objective of LLS is to train, serve, and retain. We want to train fellows through service and retain them in public health after they leave the program. We've had six classes over five years, matriculating 42 fellows, and five more will join that list in July. Fellows have provided service to 27 unique post public health laboratories, and nearly 90% of LLS fellows remain in public health. 71% of grads accepted positions at CDC. Fellows are hosted in CDC or other jurisdictional public health labs. Public health doesn't just happen at CDC, but also at the front lines of our nation, state, local, territorial, tribal, public health labs, and health departments. Many candidates apply with the goal of working at CDC, which is great, but it's important for lab scientists seeking a leadership role in this field to have some experience at the state and local level as well. This year, LLS will prioritize placements with our jurisdictional public health laboratories or in field sites as we call them. Fellows placed at field sites will have a high level of engagement with headquarter-based fellows, CDC scientists, leadership, and subject matter experts, as well as the LLS program. Of course, we anticipate matching fellows with CDC headquarter labs as well. But I encourage you now to begin thinking about your options and considering all of them when it comes to where you want to be placed as far as the whole site placement for this application year. LLS training is largely on the job, experiential and service based. On a nearly da daily basis, fellows support the mission objectives of their host labs through research contributions, conducting risk assessments, supporting laboratory operations or other routine yet high performance activities. They also provide service to the nation's public health needs through the support of CDC initiatives. This is class of 2019 fellow Nicholas Weiss, who's trapping mongoose for a rabies testing in the United States Virgin Islands. 
service and service learning are the cornerstones of LLS. Fellows provide service to unique host public health laboratories and their host site research program. LLS is not a standard postdoc experience. We are lab scientists and applied research is a key component. When you think of a postdoc, you likely think of the traditional experience at the bench most of the day working on your research. However, for LLS, the applied concept manifests in several ways that extends beyond the bench. It's truly an experience like no other. Fellows learn through their service to CDC's mission in partnership with state and local public health laboratories, through field deployments and a variety of other unique opportunities that we'll discuss more in the next slide. Shown here in this photo, we have class of 2018, a fellow Kara Levison, who was on a field, she's a field fellow in the New Hampshire Public Health Lab and is now the deputy director at the Tennessee Public Health Laboratory. One area of service learning, as well as leadership experience, is the opportunity for a fellow to lead a lab aid. Fellows are trained in the subject matter required, they're backed by a CDC subject matter expert. And they take a leadership role to offer rapid support to meet critical needs of a partner in public health laboratory. Fellows have been involved in disaster response, assist with outbreak investigations, provide surge laboratory capacity, support a lab safety and quality needs. They've provided technical expertise for surveillance testing or help with laboratory informatics and bioinformatics testing and workflows. Our sister program is the Epidemic Intelligence Service, or EIS for short, and LLS often partners with EIS officers to provide laboratory support for their epi aids. LLS has provided support to state and local jurisdictional jurisdictions on 31 lab and epi aid deployments to date. Shown here in this photo on the far left, we have Class of 2020 fellow Stephen Lavoie offering lab assistance by training staff in the United States Virgin Islands Public Health Lab on COVID testing workflows. So this timeline highlights a few representative response efforts and opportunities available for a fellow, including lab aids and joint epi aids. From 2015 to 2017, fellows responded, assisted with several responses, including Legionella, Zika, Ebola, whether internationally or domestically, uh, the program has the flexibility to scale and respond to the agencies, as well as the world's mission's critical need for public health. The first official lab aid response was in Puerto Rico in 2017 to support their lab capacity building efforts following Hurricane Maria. Several lab aids have followed this initial capacity building response. When CDC activates an agency-wide public health response, LLS fellows are highly sought after to respond. The most recent agency response, which is not shown here on this timeline, is the full support of LLS fellows for CDC COVID-19 response. LLS pivoted fully to support the agencies and nation response to COVID-19. LLS fellows are among the first to deploy with some on board the Princess cruise ship liner as it's docking and at the military base quarantine site, repatriating travelers back into the United States. Since then, fellows have played a critical role in field testing, validation studies. Shown here, we have class of 2020 fellow, Jessica Prince Guerra, validating a rapid antigen test in Arizona, providing lab support for epi teams and coordinating response logistics. All of the 2019 and 2020 fellows have deployed in support of the COVID-19 response, whether to the field or virtually to the EOC, even working from home. We anticipate that the class of 2020 will have a similar experience. There'll still be opportunities to support the COVID-19 response deployed to the field as an SME for laboratory studies or support in contact tracing or transmission studies, as well as virtual deployments. In addition to lab aids, joint epi aids and agency public health response efforts, fellows can also deploy or serve through their host lab assignment. Shown here, we have on the left, class of 2019 fellow Oren Meyer, who's providing training in Uganda on proper handling of specimens for Ebola testing. So regardless of how or where they serve, in the field or in their host site, fellows are on the front lines of public health. Our fellows participate in a variety of service-based activities, 
not necessarily associated with a deployment that provide unique leadership training opportunities. Many of these are a part of their daily duties with their host lab assignment. And our goal is to challenge fellows not just to complete an activity, complete an activity, but to take a leadership role in that activity. Here we have class of 2018 fellow Christina Carlson, who's shown here in a photo taken at the World Health Organization, in front of the World Health Organization. Christina served as a consultant to the WHO on global guidance for lab biosafety and biosecurity. So we spent a good bit of time discussing amazing field response and deployment opportunities through LLS, but the LLS experience doesn't just happen in the field, particularly when there's not a global pandemic. The magic of LLS is in the day-to-day, -day high caliber and challenging activities at a fellow's host site, the ability to engage with public health leadership at all levels across multiple agencies and those partnerships built during the process. It's also the mentorship that they receive from leaders and subject matter experts dedicated to the fellow's professional development. I want to be sure to point out that there's a good bit of time that's spent around the conference table, at the lab bench, or with a computer. There's a balance to the LLS experience. And as a program, we ensure that fellows receive the full benefits of this whole experience. In this photo, we have class of 2019 fellow Shelby Chastain Potts meeting with her host site supervisor and CDC's lab, lead lab quality expert. And Shelby is on this call um, to share a little bit about her experience today, as well as answer questions. So let's talk about the application process for a bit. So the first step is to submit your application online. Um, the portal is open right now and it'll close on June 4th. So you can access the portal through our website, which is www.cdc.gov backslash LLS. Your application uh, will be reviewed first for basic eligibility. If you don't meet these requirements, your application will be automatically rejected. After eligibility review, we review and score your actual application, which includes your education, experience, letters of recommendation, et cetera. Applicants with high quality applications advance to the first round of interviews with the LLS program. And the goal of the application is to get the interview. Then the goal of your interview is to sell yourself. After the program interview, we decide which fellows have the opportunity to match for the class. Fellows who score high enough during the program interviews will then meet all the criteria to be among the next class of fellows. You only need to match with a you need to match with just one lab. So next comes the match interviews, which coincides with the application process. We also review whole site applications at the same time that we review fellows' application. After match interviews, fellows will rank the labs they interview with, and the labs will rate the fellows. We then use an algorithm to assign the final matches. So there's a new angle to the match process this year, and we're terminant pre-match. As I mentioned earlier, public health doesn't just happen at CDC headquarters. Here we have class of 2020 fellow David Payne, who's also on the call with us today to share his experience. Um, who's preparing to run patient samples on a MySeq instrument. David was assigned or is assigned to the Washington DC Public Health Lab. The state and local public health partners like DC Lab are on the front lines of public health and they offer unique leadership and experiential training that can help drive a fellow's career goals in a way that's different than that of a CDC headquarters placement. We're happy to discuss this aspect more with anyone that's interested but it largely, it largely depends on your interests, professional development objectives, as well as your career goals. So we have new funding to boost capacity and support for jurisdictional labs. LLS is planning to prioritize field placements in the state, local, territorial, and tribal laboratories. And one way to accomplish this would be through the pre-match process. A field site laboratory can be eligible for pre-match if they have previously applied and interviewed with a candidate but they were not assigned one. So these labs can deliver superior mentorship and training opportunities. They just haven't had the chance to do so yet. They'll be able to interview with interested candidates ahead of the regular match process. So how does this impact you as an applicant? It's an advantage to that lab, but also to you as a fellow candidate if you choose to interview 
during the pre-match process because you will interview with a smaller number of host sites and compete with less candidates. Fellows, fellow candidates that match with their host lab during the pre-match will secure a spot early in the class, even before the other larger applicant pool and other labs conduct their regular match interviews. In the case that you don't match during pre-match, you will still advance to the regular match process. However, it's important to note that if you do match in the pre-match process and then decline, you won't be given an opportunity to interview during the regular match process. So again, when if you make it to pre-match, you should only assign scores to sites that you're interested in securing a two-year placement with. We're also looking into our ability to offer loan repayment to pre-match field assignees, but this is not a guarantee at this time. And this entire pre-match process is a bit much to um, explain through this presentation, but we're happy to sit and walk you through the pre-match process um, if you're interested in learning more. So let's shift, shift gears a bit to talk about how you can do your part during the LLS application process to increase your chances of selection and being a part of the LLS experience. LLS is a pretty competitive, competitive program. We place between about six to eight fellows each year, but we do have plans to expand this year. Even still, you need to put your best foot forward on the application. Remember that the goal is to get the interview, and I want to share a few tips that we think will help you to create a high quality competitive application. So we'll review the five key steps, um, beginning with eligibility, sharing your experience, strongly uh, communicating why LLS is important or the right choice for you, your letters of recommendation, and then ending um, with the collective knowledge of the LLS community, drawing on the collective knowledge of the LLS community. So let's walk through these steps. Okay, first is eligibility. If you're not eligible, your application won't be reviewed. So be sure to check the eligibility requirements before taking the time to put together an entire application. On this earlier, um, you'll need to have a PhD in laboratory science or a laboratory related discipline. For example, microbiology, molecular biology, even chemistry or biochemistry. Some public health and health scientists doctoral programs will also meet the eligibility requirement if they have a lab research component. You can also be considered eligible if you have a doctorate in a less research-focused laboratory and public health field, such as healthcare science, if you have research experience elsewhere or with a previous master's. But note that you may not be as competitive as other applicants. Fellows must be a US citizen or have permanent resident status. We can't accept international applications or support visas at this time. If you're still in graduate school, you must defend your dissertation before March 31st, the year that you enter the program. So for this application cycle, that will be March 31st of 2022. If you have a foreign transcript, they must have an accompanying equivalency report. We understand that some international doctoral programs don't provide transcripts. These still must have an equivalency report. A scanned copy of your doctoral um, diploma won't be sufficient. Okay, so the core of the application, making sure you bring the wow factor to your why of LLS and why is LLS right for you and your career goals. Make the best choice for who you ask for recommendation letters. And also make sure that you leverage the LLS community, the fellows, alumni, even the program for input and support. Fellows are happy and alumni are happy to meet with candidates that are interested in learning more about the program as well as sharing their LLS experience. So you'll be asked to work through your work history and experience, be thorough as well as organized. And I suggest that you lead off with your most recent experience first, for each work experience entry, give us enough detail so we understand the scope of a particular project, any technical skills that you gain through that experience. You want to focus on how you took initiative or thinking creatively. Um, discuss whether you manage complex projects or tasks. Did you collaborate with others as a part of this project? Discuss leadership where applicable and any resultant publications or relevant abstracts or presentations. We don't expect you to tell us about how you were an amazing leader. You're coming to LLS hopefully to gain leadership experience, but we'd like to see where you have taken the opportunity to practice leadership and been assertive. Show us that you have leadership potential, essentially. 
We've talked a lot about LLS being a service learning program. Are you service oriented? That's something to point out in the application. Are you able to share details about how you've helped supported others, perhaps through mentorship or volunteerism? Uh, this is important, yet an often overlooked and underdelivered part of the application. Your application will also include a few personal statement types of questions, one where you can share with us your career goals, your passion for public health. These responses should communicate why LLS is the right fit for you. Why is it the next logical step in your career and how the program will help you reach those goals in public health? Where do you wanna be in five years? Is it in public health? What about LLS appeals to you? These are all things that you should think about when you're writing uh, your personal statement responses. Um, what skills or experiences do you need that LLS can help you obtain? It's another question. It's often helpful to have concrete knowledge of the program in order to accurately describe how you can best leverage LLS for your professional development. So make sure that you visit the LLS website. And again, please talk to fellows and alumni and ask questions about the program. They're always happy to speak to interested. You'll need two letters of recommendation for the application. Um, these should be from supervisors or senior mentors that you know well that can speak about your accomplishments as well as your scientific skills and leadership potential, as well as your ability to manage projects and your time and overall suitability for the program. So these can be from direct supervisors from a job, perhaps your doctoral or postdoctoral advisor, your PI from grad school, um, or a member of your thesis or dissertation committee that was hands-on and involved in your project. Often we receive letters from applicants colleagues or even a committee member who's not clear or did not know the applicant that well. So make sure that you choose carefully. A poor recommendation can hurt your application score and reflect, reflect fairly poor on you as well. You can give a heads up to those that are writing recommendation letters on your behalf that it's not really a letter per se. It's a standardized form uh, through which the recommender will answer specific questions, but does have the option at the end of the form to add additional comments. So we love reading these additional comments and it gives the recommender an opportunity to highlight areas that you excel that our standard questions did not address. And again, I think I've mentioned this several times to just reach out to current fellows and alumni to learn more about the program. And that includes the program as well. You can always send an email to the LLS mailbox. Once the application, portal is open. We can't coach you, um, but we're happy to answer questions. Our fellows and alumni are happy to chat and support with you and share their experiences and give feedback on your application um, so that you can submit that with confidence. You can find a list of fellows and alumni on the LLS website, and if you need help or contact information, we can help. The program can help with that. Since we're discussing tips, I want to review a few tips beyond the application process. First is the interview. Again, the goal of the interview is to sell yourself. You'll meet with at least two program representatives, one which will be the LLS lead who's on the line today, either myself or another um, staff member. We'll ask questions that allow you to learn more about your career goals, how you manage conflicts or challenges, take initiative, as well as how well you're able to collaborate with others. We'll seek to better understand how you work in a team, how you pivot to adapt to change in needs or tasks. Interviews will be conducted virtually through a video conference call, but it should be treated the same as an in-person interview, which requires the same level of professionalism. There's usually time for fellows to, or applicants to ask a few questions at, at the end of the interview as well. So be prepared and come with you know, some key questions that you would like to get answered. For match, candidates receive a packet of applications as well as all of the available labs that are going to be a part of the match process for LLS. So you will have the power to select the labs that you're most interested with. We're not previewed to the types of questions that the labs ask during match interviews, but this is a great question that you can ask of alums and current fellows. So take advantage of asking them about the match process and the type of interview questions that are um, asked of candidates. You'll also be encouraged to ask questions so that you can determine from your vantage point if this is the right fit for you. 
And I strongly urge that you don't rate labs that are not a good fit for you. In other words, the goal should not be to just get any slot in LLS, however, uh, but rather the goal should be to match with a lab that is an ex excellent fit for your goals, both long-term as well as short-term. Remember that most of the time during the two-year fellowship will be at this whole site. So it's important that it's a good fit for you as well as a good fit for that lab. Okay, so we've talked about the program, different experiences that you can expect, and we walked through some tips for preparing your application. So does LLS sound like the right fit for you? Regardless of whether you are assigned to the field or headquarters lab, LLS fellows are employees who have unparalleled career opportunities. They are supervised and mentored by scientists who are experts in their fields. Fellows have unique opportunities to engage with multiple different SMEs by participating in or leading cross-cutting projects in the agency or at field host site locations. These projects have a direct and positive impact on operations, scientific quality, or public health at large. So are you ready to make a difference? Like Jessica Jacobs shown in this photo here, who's a class of 2019 fellow assigned to Massachusetts State Public Health Lab. This photo was included in the Atlanta Journal Constitution Responder feature. And for those that are not familiar with the Atlanta Journal Constitution, it's a local newspaper in the metropolitan area of Atlanta. So if you're ready to make a difference, not just for others, but a difference for your own career path and professional development too, I urge you to apply to the LLS program. Applications that I mentioned is currently open. We opened on April 1st. Applications will close fairly soon on June 4th. And please be sure to visit the website, cdc.gov LLS, if you need additional details about the program as well as for information um, on current and former fellows of the program. So we will switch gears and I have two current fellows on the line um, today, Shelby Chastain Potts, as well as David Payne. And I would love for them to give a brief overview just of their experience um, in LLS to date. Shelby is a second year fellow and David is a first year fellow. Um, Shelby, do you want to kick off and just tell us a little bit about your LLS experience and introduce yourself? Sure, I cannot un, I cannot show my video. I don't know if someone is freezing it. All right, as Shanice said, my name is Shelby Chastain Potts. I am a class of 2019 LLS fellow and it has just been an amazing experience. I can't really say much more beyond that. Um, so when I first joined the LLS program, I joined the infectious disease pathology branch. With my group, there wasn't many opportunities to deploy as part of the branch normal roles and responsibilities. So I signed up to participate in the polio response in Ghana. Hi. So I deployed for the polio surge response in Ghana. So in addition to working with a laboratory, as she said, that there are many different opportunities that you have beyond your normal scope of duties because you're able to work with several different SMEs across the board. This deployment was a great opportunity. It was my first introduction into the EOC as well as working with other responders in the field. Little did we know that this two year spans would turn into a major outbreak and require many deployments across many different spectrums, such as quality, laboratory services, uh, tracing, epidemiology, surveillance, et cetera. So I was quickly brought back from my deployment to assist with the, poly, uh, with the pandemic. I then deployed to the DC Public Health Lab where I actually got to meet David who is currently deployed there. So I assisted with lean, lean methodology with their laboratory service, trying to basically optimize the intake and output of their test results. 
you can actually see here in this photo, this was from the DC Public Health Lab. I was working with one of the drive-through centers where we were verifying the patient identifier information on the samples prior to the shipment to the laboratory. There are so many components that go into testing that you might not normally think on a daily basis. So when we receive samples, one of the high priorities is ensuring that we have the traceability for the patient's information. If we cannot verify who the sample belongs to, then we cannot accept it because we can't provide them with the results. So this is just one example of the many opportunities that we have to look at the quality systems in place and look for continual improvement. After my deployment with DC, I returned back to my home lab where we were then receiving autopsy samples from the pandemic. Due to the short staffed, I ended up going back into the lab to help with co-infection, which was beyond my normal scope as an LLS fellow. So I was then able to reintroduce myself into the laboratory. It was a great experience because as a laboratory in background, I started to miss the lab. But as people who are entering into this fellowship, we're looking for more opportunities such as in service and in leadership. And I quickly realized that the trajectory that I had entered into at the beginning of the fellowship had changed my initial thoughts of wanting to stay in the laboratory working on the bench shop. I quickly realized that the quality component was the highlight of my day. Luckily, I was able to transition once we were able to bring in more people to help staff for our co-infection testing. My supervisors at IDPB have been amazing and they have provided such great opportunities, including the opportunity to step in as the interim quality manager for my branch. I began this step in September. So I have now had a wide diverse experience as a fellow working in the field deployments, working in the laboratory at the bench, as well as the quality management systems. This diversity has truly allowed me the opportunity to identify what the next steps are for me. I have actually accepted a new position prior to the end of the fellowship with my host site. I am now the QMS and CLIA compliance unit lead. We just completed our CLIA inspection and it went very well. And I get so excited about the most minute details that people hate pretty much working in the lab but I'm your girl. If you ever have any quality questions, please come to me. And I'm happy to speak more about all of my love for quality. <laughs> but that's kind of an overview of my experience. Should I just jump in, Shanice? Sure thing. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm David. I am a second or a first year. I'm about to be a second year. Um, and like Shelby said, uh, we actually met, she was on a lab aid in DC uh, when I started my fellowship. So uh, a lab aid is essentially where a, a state or local public health lab calls Tara, I don't know the actual process, but let's just say they call the bat phone and Tara picks up and says, okay, sure, I can send you an LLS fellow. And, and they go out and do their thing. And Shelby was the one to do their thing uh, because here in DC, we were really struggling. We were a really small lab um, we've, we've grown quite a lot since the beginning of the pandemic. We just needed some experienced people and they knew I was coming uh, with no experience, but another, another person was coming. And so they called for Shelby uh, first, which is great. Uh, I just got to continue some of the stuff she started. Um, when, I, when I got here, sort of, uh, it still continues, I guess. My, my overarching project has obviously been COVID related because everything is COVID related right now. Um, I, I drove a U-Haul into town with my wife and small children late, late Thursday night. And Friday morning at 7 a.m., Shelby and I and the lab director and a couple of other people were at a clinic uh, evaluating them for whether or not they could uh, run a rapid COVID test. We were, we were gonna put an instrument in their facility. Um, and so that was just a baptism by fire because I, I had barely been in town uh, and had never heard of this test or anything like that. And I started training people on it before I'd ever actually run it. Uh, so one thing you will learn is to learn quickly. Uh, but since then I've, I've uh, placed these in 14 other sites around the district um, and I support them with, with 
their quality programs. I help them with proficiency testing, with training. Um, and like I say, that's been sort of my overarching thing. But I also have, uh, while I'm here in the DC Public Health Lab, I've rotated through all of the different departments, learning how all of the pieces of the machine fit together um, with the idea that I, I am finding ways that they can fit together better or other ways they can, they can communicate better. So I started, I spent two months in the accessioning department pulling up test request forms and tubes of sample, making sure the patient identifiers matched. And I did a thousand of those a day for two months and putting stickers on tubes, uh, which showed me a lot of the places where that process needed to be improved, right? Because it was a very laborious process with lots of manual steps. And so from there, I moved on uh, to some of the testing departments. And again, I, I spent a month pipetting individual COVID samples to run on our, our Panther, which is just a, a testing instrument. Um, and from there, I moved on to next-gen sequencing, where they were sequencing about 10 to 15 samples a week. And my job there was increase our capacity. Uh, they, they just told me, we want to be sampling 100 samples a week. Make that happen. Um, <laughs> and so I, I looked at the workflow and all those things, um, and it's sort of done that everywhere I go. I, I look at the workflow, I look at how we can make it better. Um, just because this pandemic really hit us all by surprise and we didn't have processes in place to run this many things. Uh, the statistic that we give out a lot in DC is that in, in 2019, the lab ran 8,000 tests, total tests um, for the whole year of everything, of rabies, STDs, all this stuff. Um, at our peak in December, we were running 8,000 COVID tests a week, um, which is a lot more and needs a lot more infrastructure. So, so anyway, that's, that's one of the big things that my fellowship has been, is just really focused on optimizing workflows and processes, um, which is not something I ever anticipated when I was an academic uh, postdoc. So if, if you're in that boat, you'll figure it out. <laughs> I don't have a good uh, conclusion like Shelby did. Shelby's was great. I'm done. Well, I'll add to David's. David um, is also about to start doing some rotations with partnering clinical laboratories and hospital laboratories. And I think that highlights one of the unique things that you can do with LLS. And Shelby kind of touched on this. You leverage your LLS experience to what your career goals are and your interests. David has interest in sitting for his um, clinical board certification exams, and this is one way that will allow him to meet that eligibility criteria, and LLS can be a conduit to that. We are not a board certification program, but we can certainly help support you and tie you in with the opportunities that, that you need in order to meet those requirements. Yeah. Agreed, uh, and, and Tara has been very helpful in, in that. You know, we meet and talk about what are my goals for my career? And I do the same with my lab director here. And like she said, one of them was sitting for boards. And so he said, well, we work with all the local hospitals. I'll make some phone calls and get you, get you some spots. And, and so, yeah, the program has been tremendous for that. Thank you, David and Shelby for sharing your experience. And um, I just wanted to mention before we start the Q&A portion, um, of the session at, to, not tomorrow, but May 18th, we have a session on Handshake at three o'clock where fellows will be able to go more in depth about their LLS experience because that entire session is just dedicated to the LLS fellow experience. So be sure to join us. And the details for that call, as well as the access information is also on the LLS website. So we're happy to open up for questions um, and you can throw questions to the program as well as to Shelby and David. So Shanice, I'll help read off one of the questions here. We already have one in the Q&A box. It says, is it better to ask the last PI or your last PI for a recommendation or the, uh, the person who knows you more even after years of, of finishing your PhD? Your last PI or the person that knows you more after finishing your PhD? Yeah. Yeah, I think for us as a whole, we just want... Um, letters that are coming from folks that know you well, that played a supervisory role, um, have a supervisory role as well as just really understand your work and who you are as a person. So I, I wouldn't say either or matters, but Tara, you can clarify. I would say if, if you don't have, if 
you don't already have the second, then ask for both of them. You know, um, I think it also depends on how long you've been out of graduate school. I may be reading into that question. It may be maybe a little, a little ways out of grad school, but whoever writes that recommendation letter needs to be in a level of seniority and have supervisory authority over you so that we can discern that that's not like your buddy or one of your colleagues down the hall that's writing that letter on your behalf. Yeah, it's, it's hard for us to take it um, seriously at that point. So Shanice, I see one of the, I don't know if you, I can, I'm happy to help monitor Q&A. Um, what types of jobs, and there's a parenthetical, so specifically, do LLS fellows find after the program? Oh, yeah. So Shelby talked about the job that she recently transitioned to. She's still a fellow, but she's, she's graduating fairly soon. A few more months and she'll be on her way, um, but she already... When she's Shelby's like one more month. <laughs> <laughs> one more month. <laughs> and she'll be on her way, but she already has a position, which is really awesome. Um, the jobs vary. We have a list of alumni on the website and we have all their current positions. We keep that up to date. So we have everywhere from the deputy director of a state public health lab um, to some fellows going to be in uh, team leads, so scientific team leads at the CDC. Some are focused more on quality management, so as QMS officers, um, it really depends. The jobs vary, and it really depends on what you want to do. Um, so we don't push fellows down any specific path. You really determine where you want to go after LLS because the training is broad. And so you can focus in and do whatever it is you feel like doing at the end of the fellowship. There's tons of opportunities and fellows can transition into multiple roles with the training that they receive in the program. For example, David is probably moving on to a big position one day as a director of a state public health lab, so. I'm doing this for you, David. <laughs> I, we'll I see, think let's, also... let's count the chickens after they hatch. Okay. <laughs> I think it's also important to note, so as a program, and it, that's one of the best parts of my job. Like currently, um, we have some fellows who are about to graduate who have their jobs you know, squared away and there are others who are still finalizing details and, and those guys are kind of sweating it a little bit and I know it's stressful, but I always joke that we've never had someone not be able to pay their mortgage. Um, but we also start pretty early, you know, trying to find out what your interests are, where do you want to be, more importantly, maybe where you don't want to be. And then as a program, we can't guarantee a position, but I can guarantee our full support behind you. I, so we try to connect you with opportunities. We give you input on interviews. We help you with your resume. We tie you in with um, people who are hiring officials or know people in the know. Uh, so we've had folks who have taken positions in um, like clinical realm. Uh, they are the lead for clinical diagnostic laboratories. Um, so for instance, one of our, our alums is um, the director at a children's hospital laboratory. We've had folks who have gone to take positions in state laboratories. Diana Reiner is a unit lead at the Michigan State Public Health Laboratory. Uh, Randy Fowler is director of the microbi microbacteriology uh, lab at New York City. Um, we also have sort of this gray area of public health. One of our 2017 alums, uh, Cecilia Kretz, she works with APHL, the Association for Public Health Laboratories, but she is the manager for the CDC cooperative agreement. So it's sort of a, a grant type mechanism, a funding mechanism. That's how we push money out to the state partners through sort of the central clearinghouse of APHL. And it's a lot of money, as in 100 plus million dollar cooperative agreements here. Um, and she manages the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Disease, so blah, NCE EZIDS, um, and uh, their portfolio, which covers anything from um, foodborne to antibiotic resistance uh, to AMD. And so she sits in a very unique position in public health that's neither at a state jurisdictional laboratory or even CDC. Um, Ultimately, our goal is to train and retain fellows in public health, but we do have folks, um, one of our more recent graduates, class of 2018 fellow, Erin Shearer, she uh, accepted a directorship position as a research laboratory um, or a vaccine center type laboratory um, with Emory. Um, so it covers the gamut. I, I, I hesitate to say that we have fellows that go do this, this, and this, because they directed that and that was their path. And so it's just like Shani said, you know, that the training is broad, 
the opportunities are endless. And as a program, we try to help you as best we can to plug you in with what's best for you. Yeah, the world is really yours and mm -hmm. it's, it's open. So lots of opportunities to fall into different areas based on your interests. I'm seeing the questions now. I was looking at the wrong box. Okay. In both places. So, but I did want to go back to that question because I'm reading it and it's reading different from um, when you said it out loud okay. or the, the question about years after finishing the PhD. Um, I think if you have completed your PhD maybe seven years ago, for example, you just, it's a judgment call. Um, you, you want to get as recent of a supervisor as possible um, to write you a recommendation letter. So it's fine to have a PI from school if you graduated a while back, but it's really a judgment call. I think your best bet is to get a most recent supervisor to write that letter. Um, there's a question about, do the reference letters need to be uploaded before the June 4th deadline? Yes, so the deadline is the same for the application as well as the letters of recommendation. Um, and then there's questions in the chat box that I'll go to. Is there a limit to time since graduation from PhD eligibility? We don't have a limit um, on the numbers of years after your graduation, so no. I want to uh, comment on that one real quick, yes. Shanice. Mm -hmm. Something to keep in mind, though, is that this is a training fellowship. If you graduated years ago with your doctorate and you've assumed a, you know, different leadership roles or risen in the ranks of your current position, it can be somewhat difficult to step back and take that role of a trainee. I'll be completely candid. We've had some fellows struggle where they came from more of a leadership role they were now in a trainee role and weren't necessarily in charge. And that's not because they weren't able to or have the capacity to lead. It's just that that was not the right time for them. Part of working in the federal government and in federal service, and particularly in service to state and local partners, is kind of knowing where you fit in the scheme of things. Um, and so that was hard for them uh, just because they had been used to being so uh, assertive. I think that we've been able to flex more muscles in these pandemic operations because our fellows were called upon to lead no matter what and where they were. But that's something to keep in mind is that if you've, if you've been out of graduate school or out of your postdoc long enough that you've assumed a more leadership role in your current position, you can guarantee we're going to ask you about, you know, ask you to reflect on your ability to step back from that and be in a trainee state of mind. So um, reflect on that and, and come up with a good answer. That's a hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's another question. Um, which part of the application is most important? Personal statement, recommendation, transcripts, or are they all equal? And I would say they're all equal. Um, one, according to our rubrics, doesn't have more weight than the other. So there is, um, you should be sure all of them will be judged equally the same. And Tara, you can add anything. You know, I, I have had some folks who, and I'm trying to now think back, I don't want to call anybody out, where I was like, what did they do in undergrad? Because I'm looking at their GPA, and of course, they can pull it together when they're in graduate school. And, and it may not tank your application, but it also is a flag for me so that if you get to the program interview stage, I'm probably going to ask you about it. Like, did you, what, what happened? Can you, can you kind of explain? Because everybody has their own personal experiences and, and situations that can affect you know, our, our GPAs. So I would say the only thing that may be slightly gray is a transcript, but a poor personal statement and recommendation will tank your application. I don't see any other questions at the moment in the Q&A box or chat box. So we'll just wait a second to see if there's any questions. And Shelby and uh, David, if there's anything that you want to add in about. Yeah. One just popped up in the Q&A about what March 20, uh, 2022 is. Oh, yes. So March 2022 was mentioned. Is this the date of the start of the program for the upcoming class? It's not. Um, so each class or cohort starts in July. So our cohort for the class of 2021 will begin July 2021. The um, period that you're applying for right now for the application that's open, that cohort will begin in July 2022. So what I mentioned about the March 2022 deadline was that if you are currently in a PhD program, the deadline to defend 
your um, dissertation is March 31st, 2022, in order to be eligible for the cohort for the class of 2021, I'm sorry, 2022. So if you're currently in your PhD, you need to defend by March 31st, 2022, in order to be eligible for the class of 2022. And I see there was a, another question about when the next webinar is to hear from current and former fellows. Oh, yes. Um, May 18th, 3 to 4 o'clock on Handshake. And that information is on the LLS website as well. So the link to actually log in to the Zoom call is on the website. And, so, and for those that aren't familiar with Handshake, it's a um, career sourcing, and I'm probably going to mess this up, but I, it, you do not have to have an account with Handshake um, to participate in that webinar. You can access it directly from the link uh, that's provided on the LOS website. Uh, there's a question for the dissertation defense date. What if we are not completely sure if we will be able to defend by March 31st? In my last year, I'm in my last year and still planning the feasibility to defend by then. Um, Tara, I'll let you take this one. You can apply. If you do not have your defense documentation signed off or a letter from your, uh, and I see David also has his hand raised, um, or a letter from your department because not everybody defends, but they can meet their graduation requirements. They just have a great graduation date. Uh, in those cases, we accept a letter from your department or a person of authority that says you've met all the graduation requirements. If you don't have either one of these, then you'll be asked to give up your spot. You can't make exceptions. We need to have that documentation for our HR, our human resources hiring processes, and there's just no way to get around that. I would just add to that, um, tell your committee that. Tell okay. them, I have a job lined up that I, I, if I don't defend by this date, I won't get this job. Uh, they, will, they want to get you a job. That's a At great point. Minded. Yeah, so it, it determines, yeah, it depends whether the onus is on you to be able to finish up your work or if you're anticipating a delay and because that happens and our committees, you know, tend to take the time a little bit. Um, but you know, be your own advocate and, and drive it. Uh, there's a question. Do a lack of formal microbiome <clears throat> classes hurt my chances of getting into the fellowship program? I have learned quite a bit of quite a bit informally through research training. And um, my answer to that will be no. So the fellows background vary um, tremendously. And what we look for for eligibility really is just a PhD in biological sciences. And um, when you come into the program, I think Christine says it best is that you'll, you'll learn as you go a lot of what you need to do, a lot of what you need to know. Um, fellows, they may have a specialty in one area and they go into a whole site where they're not familiar with that specific virus, haven't worked on it before, that specific subject matter area, um, and they dive right in and they become soon enough experts in that particular area. Shelby? Hi, yes, I'd just like to add a little to that. So my background actually is biomedical engineering, so I had no official microbiology. We definitely have diverse experiences from our PhDs, postdocs, uh, professional experiences. Uh, one recommendation that I would make in regards to entering into the interview process is to think about the skill sets that they're using in the laboratory, not necessarily the type of disease. Have you done PCR work? Have you done next generation sequencing? Are they using these techniques that you already know and they can apply those skills to a new pathogen? I think it's more important than being concerned necessarily with like the specifics of microbiology. Agree. Couldn't say it better. Um, the next question is: uh, the recommendation letters are uploaded by the candidate or by the reference person. So it's uploaded by the individual that you ask for the letter of recommendation letter, and it's not necessarily an upload. We also don't allow attachments, um, so they'll just be filling in fields um, in the application form. Sorry, the recommendation form essentially. And the candidates are not privy to the letter of recommendation that's submitted. Uh, if fellows are strewn throughout the country, how do they interact as a cohort? That's a great question. So um, the last several classes, maybe like the last three or four, 
we've had both CDC headquarter fellows as well as fellows at state and public health labs. And I think David can, David is at DC public health lab. So he can talk a bit about um, how he's able to stay connected with his cohort being that he's in DC and majority of the classes in Atlanta. So uh, I was really worried about that. Actually, I'm the only field fellow my year. Um, and then the greatest thing happened, there was this pandemic. Uh, and so like, I was worried that everybody was gonna be going to get lunch together and they can't do that and it's great. <laughs> No, so, so we interact over Zoom, right? We, we do the same kinds of things. I do the same things from DC that they're all doing from Atlanta because they're all uh, teleworking. Uh, at some point that's gonna end, but I think we've all sort of grown accustomed to um, virtual meetings. And, and so we, we have a WhatsApp group that we're always talking on. We have, you know, every other Friday we get together and have a virtual lunch where we put our laptops down in the break room and, and uh, eat lunch together. Uh, you know, you, you find a way though. And I, I don't feel like I am getting shortchanged at all by being out in the field. I still interact with all of my fellows, fellow fellows. So I'll comment further on that. Outside of pandemic operations, um, all fellows, whether you're field or headquarters, participate in their initial summer course training, also second year summer course, fall course. So we have a variety of courses and these are kind of intensive and their summer, the initial summer course is a month long. So you're gonna get a lot of time <laughs> with them. And then the other ones are about a week. And then we also bring our field fellows back in for um, uh, critical seminars, for other training opportunities. Um, you'll interact not only with your cohort of LLS, but also with your EIS officer partners on deployments. Um, we also have initiated a, a new program here at CDC. It's brand new, uh, just in the last couple of months called an internal lab aid that I changed the name, but essentially where we provide this laboratory support that we used to do with jurisdictional labs and still do, but sometimes there are headquarter labs that need that same opportunity. And it's also a great time for our fellows to be able to cross train with other CDC labs. Well, if you're field fellow, right now we have our Massachusetts field fellow in headquarters right now doing that. And so she's able to hobnob with her, um, her colleagues and interact with other um, SME or subject matter experts here on campus as well. So we also have not only our class WhatsApp chats, but we have a two year, the ones that are currently active, but then an alumni chat as well. It's amazing. You will not, you can't understand how great of a resource that is just to have all those people in one location. So with all these deployments or just working at your natural host site, we typically have questions. We just go to that chat and send it there. We understand that we're not the smartest people. We have our own expertise in different areas, but we know someone from this LLS program that is an expert in each of these scenarios. And so we have that foundation, that network that we can reach out to. And just from those chats, and then like David mentioned, uh, we have some late night meetings on Zoom where it's just having a few drinks <laughs> necessarily just to connect with one another and see how everyone is doing. So you'll definitely be able to connect no matter where you are. So we don't have too much more time left. We have like two minutes before we have to end the call. I see quite a bit of questions about specific eligibility. If I have a degree in this area, do I qualify? Am I eligible? Feel free to send that to the LLS um, email box, mailbox, LLS at cdc.gov. And then we can address your specific eligibility um, questions. There's a couple more here. I'm just trying to see what we can get to before the two minutes end. Oh, okay, so when will the first round of interviews begin and what is the time frame between the program interview and the whole site match interview? So apologies because um, we recently changed our schedule and I no longer know it by heart, but everything is posted on the LLS um, website. The time frame between program interviews and match interviews is typically between about a month to two months. Um, so we should be wrapping up eligibility reviews within maybe like around uh, June, and then the actual application review process will conclude around July or August, and then interviews will happen shortly after, so between August and September, but I don't have the exact dates, but if you go to the website, we have a timeline of what happens in which month, and we stick um, really closely to that specific timeline.
and it's 159. So I don't think we have any more time for questions. This was a really great discussion. I want to thank Shelby and David for joining and sharing their experiences. And um, if you have additional questions, feel free to email us. You can also reach out to Shelby or David um, if you have additional questions. <laughs> oh, great, David put his email in the chat. Um, so yeah, feel free to take, take advantage of reaching out to current fellows to ask about the application process, as well as pick their brains a bit about um, what they're doing in the fellowship. It'll help you prepare your application and make it stronger. So. Thank you everyone for joining today and we look forward to receiving your application.